system, picking up on that actuator, uh, a key point in that, that actuator is what actually points the nozzles of those main engines, as you know, Walter, and that's a very critical thing, clearly, uh, but worth underscoring that what we're talking about here is simply the sensor that is looking after that actuator. Now, the thing about it is, if they, were tried, if they would go in there and try to replace that sensor, they'd have to roll it back the vehicle assembly building and put on a new engine and that is why they're doing the work around as you just well they're not expecting this to happen they're, they're, this uh, i was pointing this out as the safeguards that they build into any of these launches uh, this is only an indicator not the actuator itself so they, they think they've got a means of bypassing that particular indicator so they'll get the readout they need without that one working but they'll know at two whether that's so or not. All right. Now, uh, from, from this launch, expected launch, to uh, the soon-to-be launch of Air Force One, Andrews Air Force Base, uh, Andrew, uh, the Air Force One taxiing there, the president on his way in this direction. You know, it's worth pointing out here, uh, as we look at a shot of the astronauts here, there they are. That's the classic shot, the money shot, as we call it, of the crew walkout. To the right, we have Kurt Brown. To the left, Shiaki Mukai, who already was the first... Japanese woman in space, Steve Lindsay to the left, John Glenn, Scott Perzinski, Pedro Duque, and Steve Robinson, the Discovery 7, walking through the operations and checkout facility, getting a high five there from an employee, and on their way outside to that waiting airstream, which will take them off to the launch pad, uh, actually into the elevator first. But uh, we've talked about these uh, jitters. You, you never see it in their faces, do you, Walter? No. no, no they're, they're nothing but uh, confident. Uh, uh, pleased with the, what they're about to do. Yes, indeed. They're headed down that elevator, and uh, as they head down that elevator, you know, I, we're looking at Air Force One there. It made me think, you know, uh, a lot of people make uh, the mistaken assumption that the space shuttle is as reliable as, say, an airliner. It really isn't. We're talking about two million parts here, the most complicated device ever made uh, by man. How, we should point out that there is an inherent uh, uh, complexity and risk here. Oh, absolutely. Uh, total. There's, uh, there are all sorts of risks. There's a, there's a risk today that has been much considered, and uh, NASA writes it off, says that they've taken care of this. But this, uh, this uh, shuttle, uh, we haven't had a shuttle launch in four months now. And, uh, and this is the longest period between shuttle launches uh, for a, a very long time. There's some concern that the, that the launch pad crew uh, is a little rusty. Uh, they've been going through extra uh, drills this week to be sure that if there's any rust, it's been polished away by now. But that's just the kind of thing that uh, gives consideration uh, to the launch team as to how, how ready they really are for this launch. Uh, th there's, uh, there are all sorts of risks involved. There's a risk with John Glenn himself. Uh, it's acknowledged that there is some risk in taking a 77-year-old man up on this, uh, this shuttle flight. Uh, he is, after all, 77. His parts are wearing out as well. Uh, if one of them gives way uh, on this mission, uh, it may jeopardize the mission. It may have to return to Earth to uh, save his life. That uh, consideration has been uh, very much uh, uh, debated by the launch people and NASA itself. They've decided that the risk is one that they can take. And NASA has pointed out that they really haven't taken any extra special precautions for John Glenn on this mission. As you mentioned earlier, two medical doctors on board, but that's a complete coincidence. The other issue is the medical kit is pretty much the same. Uh, you've got your gauze, you've got your bandages, and in addition, on recent shuttle flights, they've added a defibrillator. And now let's watch that vehicle as it makes the half-hour trip toward the launch pad to arrive at the uh, white room. Uh, according to my watch, Things are running exactly on time. They know how to run a railroad here sometimes, yeah. huh? <laughs> I wouldn't trust my watch for that, but uh, if you trust yours, that's fine, Miles. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> now, they'll go to that white room, uh, which is uh, what we've been seeing this morning with some of the uh, closeout crew there. And uh, once they get in the white room, they'll begin the process of putting the helmets on and, and suiting up. And, you know, t listening to Alan Bean talking about how there was dead silence in that vehicle, yeah, that's an that's interesting, interesting thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You'd think there'd be a lot of banter back in the I imagine maybe there aren't with some other crews. Uh, Wally Schwab's crew, I think, probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Wally couldn't resist a punt or two, I'm sure, on the way to the pad, on the way to space, and everywhere else he was involved. Of course, the difference was back then, too, they had their helmets on as they walked out, had to yeah, carry their right. air in yeah, a suitcase in this case. And by the way, we just saw a picture of the white room to which I was referring there. Yeah. Uh, and you know, those people up there uh, work long and hard to make sure everything is buttoned up just right, don't they?
You know, it's perfectly acceptable. We're talking about risk to, to Glenn's health up there. It's perfectly acceptable for people to question the validity of this as a scientific flight. That's 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 fair. That's that's that's, that's fair game. And uh, their questions should be asked about it. Obviously, their questions were asked in the two years after John began to lobby for this flight by a lot of uh, experts. Uh, but one thing that it seems to me is being forgotten here, Miles, is that most of these flights are life environmental flights. They're, they're life science flights. They're flights to find out what happens to individuals in extended space under certain circumstances. And, uh, and not only to individual human beings, but to all sorts of animals and, uh, and small, small, small things. But the, uh, uh, since that is a, that, that's a major function of these shuttle flights. Why not take one man on one mission, 77 years old, to test the age of it? It seems to me, instead of being concerned about taking one, they ought to think about taking one on every flight. Well, but that, and that brings it to the criticism, because what many people say is, we don't see any follow-on flights. We don't see a, a second data point, if you no. will, and I guess NASA has to respond to yeah. that over the years. Well, there'll be more. There'll be more. You gonna volunteer? Sure. Well, that's why I'm talking this up. <laughs> All right. We're gonna I'm hoping Mr. Golden's listening. To <laughs> yeah, to I'm sure he is. <laughs> All right. We're going to take a break with the uh, crew on the way to Launch Pad 39B and the clock counting down right now at about two hours and 50 minutes and some change. Uh, a picture from on top of the vehicle assembly building there showing the shutter, the crawler tracks, which take that huge vehicle out to the launch pad. Countdown counting down. Stay with CNN as we continue our extensive coverage of the launch of the Discovery 7. Lucky with the weather, you and I were just talking about how his first mission was scrubbed four times. Yeah. And it was very frustrating for him, wasn't very it? Very frustrating, and the family, because we were with Annie and the kids at the time. That's right. You all had stayed in Arlington. Yes. And watched it together with Annie and also David and Lynn. I went over that morning and built a fire in the fireplace and set up three television sets for CBS, ABC, and NBC. And, uh, of course, we were inundated with TV crews out in front at that time. What was that like, watching that with them? Well, it, uh, it has its anxious moments, of course. Uh, the strain of takeoff is probably one, and the next one was reentry coming back, were the two areas I think they were most on. Once he was given a go for orbit, it was a great relaxation of uh, tension within the house, and uh, it was just really great to be. I had promised John I'd stay with Annie during the flight, and we're delighted to be very close by with her today. Are you going to be watching it with Mrs. Oh, Glenn and well, the children? Well, we will not be right with Mrs. Glenn because they keep the crews together, crew families together, to, for a bit of privacy. And uh, but. We're, we're within a few hundred yards of where <laughs> they are. close by. Right. You got to see Senator Glenn last night, I understand, at yes. an event that was planned for the families and That's close correct. friends of the astronauts. We went out to the shuttle itself with it in the background. A beautiful picture, of course. And uh, the, all the astro, the crew were there with their wives and uh, their families. Uh, and we were allowed to get within 10 feet of them and talk to them. So it was, it was really an inspirational sight. What did he have to say? How's he doing? Oh. He's uh, bubbling over with enthusiasm, and uh, I, it, it gives me great joy to see the, the change that has come over him since he's gotten the clearance to go in this Almost thing. become a little boy again, I know. Oh, yeah. What a, what a hero who's put his line, uh, life on the line so many times for this country. What it's, makes him an American icon? You repeatedly read that in every account. Why do you think he's such a role model? Well, I think it has an awful lot to do with his family uh, background. His mother and father were a very strong Christian background. Uh, they were disciplinarians. His mother was quite a, quite a strong lady, and uh, she did a lot to, you know, fix John up to what he is today. And I think that's a lot of what brought us together was the same family background. And he's been. persistent as heck, isn't he? Oh, he's the most <laughs> persistent. When Dan Golden called me about going, he said, can you help me with this guy? I said, he's the most persistent individual I've ever known. When he thinks he's right, uh, there's nobody can stop him. Uh, Look out. And he's a great believer in the squeaking wheel gets the grease. So. Well, it worked <laughs> this time, didn't it? Yes, it sure did. General Miller, so nice to meet you. Certainly Thanks a so pleasure, much for Kitty. coming by. Our pleasure. And, uh, we really appreciate your and being here. 
good luck to you, Thank too. you. Have fun. And we'll be back. The seven-member crew of the Space Shuttle Discovery, they are getting closer to the launch pad, mm -hmm. and if all goes well, closer to the launch. That they are. Their destination right now, uh, right now is called the White Room. That's the entryway to the shuttle hatch, and we'll see the astronauts again, all seven of them, put on their helmets and then crawl into the orbiter. An exciting day, and we'll have live coverage throughout the morning here on CNN, so stay tuned for that.